So, good morning. One of those days, just thought I would turn on the cameras. I am finishing up a color here that I'm going to um, just put some head cement on. Um, I did uh, want to do another uh, just live or almost live um, type uh, video. Got a lot of good feedback. Um, apparently people like to sit and listen to me babble. Um, which, to be honest, I kind of understand there have been hours I spent just standing at um, the edge of my father's tying bench um, and just watching him tie. I just took a quick look at the clock. It looks like we're right before um, about 11, 11 a.m. Um, so, you know, and I do the same thing. Um, when I sit and tie, I usually have, I have a laptop just off to my right here. Um, sometimes I use the, um, the other GoPro that's with that, kind of like a... Um, computer camera um, when I'm doing like, I don't know, uh, zoom calls or that type of thing. So the camera is mounted right above the uh, edge of the laptop. Uh, the, the laptop does have its own internal camera, but if I use an external camera, I can run it through my mixing board. Um, so then I could also use the other two cameras. Um, maybe take this one, which is camera one. I could put it above me and um, maybe do a bird's eye view, which reminds me, let's switch over and I'll turn my face on. Um, so today I, you know, just decided to throw the camera on and do another almost live. So, um, unfortunately, I, I don't have, since I'm not live, you know, I won't get to interact with people um, on the monitor asking questions or whatnot. Um, those, those types of videos I really do enjoy doing. Um, but right now I am finishing up these plain purple bucktails with the black head and... I got a couple tails. They're super nice. They're big. Um, the purple on these, it's a cool color. Okay, so, you know, if, if you had to look at it, to me it looks like there's probably more blue in this as opposed to um, red. This is the type of purple I typically like to um, tie with. It's a nice bright purple. Separately they look just fine, but together you can tell the difference. This bright purple um, is, the, is the purple that I'm typically buying. Um, I don't like a, a light purple like a lilac. Um, but this isn't terrible, but I don't want to tie the majority of the um, black and purple, which of course is the most popular color. Um, and keeps me the most busy. Um, but I can use it for a solid purple. And, and we're going to do something special today um, after I finish putting the head cement on these. But um, what it's definitely not is, as you can tell here, this is blue-violet. You know, pet peeve of mine. When you, order, when you order deer tails and you say, I would like purple and you're picking purple, and you're looking at the picture on the computer, and you're picking purple, and they send you this. Is that purple? Yes. Um, but it's blue-violet. The purple I like, blue-violet. And you can most certainly tell the... 
Oh my goodness. You can most certainly tell the difference when you hold them up to each other. Blue violet, the purple I like, right? So this is the purple I got that I to me seems like a cool purple. And blue violet. You can definitely see the difference. Um, but this, what I'm calling a cool purple, it is the correct color purple. It just, like I said, it has that cool tone to it. Um, I do have a good use for this, and I think it's going to um, be, it's going to use up some jigs that I uh, have had for quite some time. And it will also, more than likely, since I've sold a few of these recently, and I want to see what the um, response is when I do offer a little bit more, other than just a custom order, uh, offering these, if there'll be some recognition, particularly in the area where I sell jigs, here in central New York, um, where I might start producing these again. Um, the head style, of course, is that Barumba head that um, my father was always known for. It was a, a jig that um, he designed, is his design. Um, but this color that I'm referring to is a lilac. So instead of a black head, it's kind of a lilac purple. Um, it was a custom color. He didn't, he only did it for uh, one or two specific customers. And he would only do it if they both, I don't, I don't know how many guys there was. There's probably three or four, but he would only do it if a couple of them wanted them at the same time because mixing the epoxy paint um, to get the right color, he would, he would mix a full batch. Um, but if you're only painting a couple dozen jigs, um, that's all, that's wasted paint. And, and epoxy, even back in the day, was was pretty expensive. Um, not uncommon, you know, a gallon of it, 30, 40 bucks. Um, now that same gallon is is upwards of 70, 70, 75 dollars. For the epoxy paint and the uh, hardener, the part A and part B. So it was a color that wasn't. Um, he didn't. He didn't offer it um, regularly. It was really just a custom color. There was a couple guys that would call me. I would get a call once every five or six years. Hey, it's so and so. I was a friend of your dad's. Um, do you happen to have any of this color jig or can you paint them? Um, Dad did tell me uh, about it. Um, I didn't write it down back in the day. Um, Dad had a stroke around 2001. He passed in 2003. So I remember sometime in that time period between his stroke and the time of his passing. He did tell me about the color. He told me the mixture, and I never wrote it down. I just thought, yeah, I know how to make purple, right? But recently, uh, two things. I found a, a big stash of them, good for me. And before finding the stash of them, because I searched and searched um, and didn't find them, um, I ended up doing a small batch. So I, I painted up eight or nine dozen. Um, the customer took five dozen. So I got four dozen of these sitting around. And what we have here, here I'll just take it out of the vise. What we have is the Barumba, and it's uh, just a cu custom mix of the uh, epoxy paint for this lilac. I'm calling it lilac. And it's just a nice, it's a, it's a nice color. Um, here's one of 
couple of the originals from Dad. Um, found a whole bunch of these old style flatheads. I don't even tell you these. I have, a, I have a different mold for flatheads now because these flatheads are much thinner. Um, great jig, it's just the other molds, people like them better, so I go with a little bit thicker profile. Um, but here's one of the jigs from back in the day. The only thing I did to this was I added the black pupil. Up until a few years ago, uh, our pupils, and I still have the markers in my cup. Um, I don't know if I have any here on my table. But originally, the pupils on our jig, and as you can see here, here's a perfect example. It's a um, Sharpie marker, but it's worn down just from use, so the tip is rounded. Um, this one I might have even cut with an X-Acto knife, to be honest. Um, but that's what we would use for the pupils. And um, occasionally I would get out some enamel to do pupils with. But enamel is difficult uh, to paint with because as it kind of dries, you know, you have a little... Uh, even if I put it in a smaller jar and I'm just using the cap lid um, as my paint, after 20, 30 minutes, it starts to get a little bit tacky. So you, you dot your pupil and then you, you get kind of a spider web that comes off with the paint being tacky. So I didn't usually use the um, enamel, but the Sharpie marker for pupils was our go-to. Um, to be honest, the problem with, with doing it that way is if I was doing a whole bunch of jigs, they dry out a little bit as you're using them. So <coughs> you might, you might see some pupils that aren't as crisp and dark from jig to jig. For most people, that wasn't a big deal. Um, the eyes wasn't. They weren't a problem at all, and we painted the eyes that way for decades. But, um, yeah, so this being one of the originals, I did use the um, airbrush paint just to add a, a quick pupil. Looks much better, much cleaner. So what we're going to do, and I have some 5.8 Barumbas. That's what I'm tying today. And I'm going to do two. I'm going to do just the solid purple right now using this tail that what we were calling the um, the cool purple, the cool color. And again, that referring it referring to it as a cool purple, referring to the temperature or the tone, right? of the uh, color so it's got more of a bluish cold looking um, tone to the color as opposed to um, if it was more reddish and bright and lively right my wife's the one with the art degree not me so what are we tying so I've locked on my size a thread just like normal, we'll begin with a pinch of this cool purple. And I haven't asked, you know, I could call up my supplier. This guy, he does special things for me. I get blue done from him. Um, and it's a, a guy up in Canada that I get a lot of material from. But it's usually just special specialty things. Um, I have a feeling, I could ask him, I haven't. But I would bet that he probably used the RIT dye, the type of dye that you'd find in a fabric shop for this tail. One or two broken tips. That's what you might see me pulling out of here. Um, and RIT's not bad. Um, they have a couple different shades of purple, and um, one of them is kind of this bluish tint 
purple, though it's not um, blue violet. It is actually purple, but um, I suspect that's what he used. I, I think he used the Rit dye, it, which is fine. Rit is is a good quality dye, um, and will dye tails and feathers just fine, uh, especially if you're doing it with heat as well as the uh, acid solution. So when I uh, dye tails, um, I do it just like Dad did. We add uh, white vinegar to the mix, um, just a little bit. And we um, heat the tails and keep them stirred. Um, you get it as hot as you can right before that boiling point. So you don't want to boil the tails um, because that would ruin the hair. But um, if you keep the temperature as hot as you can, stir them, and you use the... Uh, vinegar for your acid solution. Uh, you can you can actually use the RIT dye and does just fine. Does just fine. I prefer using um, uh, the Jacker dyes I think it's called. Um, which is a, a dye um, I think it's from England. Very good quality dye for not just fabrics, but tails and leather, feathers. So we're tying this on just a solid purple. Purple, purple top, purple bottom wing. And then I'm going to add a little bit of flash. This is the New Age Crinkle Flash, which this past year has been my new favorite. This color is called uh, Winter Run Blue. It's a really great color. Not only does it have that warmer color purple, um, but you also see flashes of blue and gold and silver. A touch of green occasionally, a touch of yellow occasionally, um, though mostly purple. So we're going to use that. Um, I think it will complement the color, this purple color. It will complement the um, lilac type head uh, because you do you do see some um, that lilac purple in this crystal crystal flash, the New Age crinkle flash rather. And occasionally you see, and I'm sure it has to do with what's in the surroundings but occasionally I see touches of red as well it's not it's not that the tinsel itself is red um, but I see red reflections like little little pinpoints of red which will also kind of match our collar so I'm not counting these out one by one but I'm taking a pinch of about six five or six there is some flash in here that um, is super thin and like crinkly hair-like. If, if I can't control them in my pinch, I'll take out the piece that's a little bit too unruly. But a simple pinch of about five or six. My vice is unlocked and I can just put this right into place. Three wraps towards the bend of the hook, a couple wraps back uh, to lock it in place to crisscross. And I was really lucky here the way I sized my pinch. Uh, the flash falls just short of the ends of the tail itself. Perfect. Um, I don't like the flash to extend past the hairs. Um, I was always taught that you'll get um, short strikes if you have any hair fibers or tinsel or anything like that extending past the tail. Um, 
I kind of think that's true. I know there's guys that make perfectly good jigs and they do have tinsel or some sort of trailer that extends past the uh, bucktail. I'm sure they catch all kinds of fish. So it's just something that was always taught to me. The other thing about this tail is it feels not quite hollow. I guess I would say spongy. A touch waxy. Um, not something that I could fix by washing it. It's not that it's oily. Um, but it has a, a waxy feel to me. Um, it's just a texture. Another reason why I think it was the RIT dye that, that this guy's using. Um, that's what I suspect. I do have some, I do have both the RIT and the Jacquard or Jacquard or whatever you call it. Uh, um, dye. I do have I do have a color of each couple a few colors of each rather. Um, so one of these days maybe in this uh, as it gets a little bit warmer, if we have a couple really nice days in a row, I have 50 or so tails in the garage that have been salted since December. And I should, uh, maybe I'll get them out. Uh, record the process of washing and um, just showing how I've prepared the tails. And uh, perhaps we can do a test. We can, uh, we can dye a couple in each of the... Um, different dyes I think that would be that would be probably a uh, fun a fun video to make so here we go we got that cool purple the new age crinkle flash in the uh, winter run blue color our size a thread for the collar and that custom lilac colored head real nice jig pretty jig Go off screen just for a second and take care of this. I'm, I'm kind of monitoring two different uh, computers right now. <clears throat> Very good. Okay. So I did make my run uh, before opening day, and uh, I think I might have mentioned in, in a, maybe it was the kayak video I just did, uh, stopped at a couple new stores, uh, stores that were new to me, um, figuring out my circuit for deliveries. Um, actually, I have another new store to stop at this coming weekend, but um, May, early May is, is hard for me, um, not in the sense that <laughs> I'm overworked or anything, but there's a lot of, I have a lot of family um, obligations. What do we got in May? We got Mother's Day coming up. We got uh, my wife's birthday. Can't forget that. Um, my granddaughter's birthday, and uh, of course they all just happen to fall on weekends this month. And I'm not retired, I still have a regular full-time job, so um, makes it a little bit difficult to uh, making deliveries or planning my deliveries for May just so I can keep everybody in the family happy. But I will be out this weekend. Um, I'll go out Saturday. Make my runs. There is a new store, brand new store, 
that I'll be stopping at. It's a, a guy that uh, knew my dad and uh, called me specifically, which I appreciate. I like that. Um, but I'll just work them into my circuit. And again, I'm just... There's, every, every so often there's just a broken tip and I'm just trying to grab those, pull them out of the pinch. Most people might not notice them, I, I would think. As long as you're catching fish, I don't think people care, but um, it annoys me. So, you know, I don't want to... If I can help it, I want to make sure that those broken tips are not in the jig. So there we go. We lock it on. A few wraps towards the bend of the hook. A few wraps crisscrossing just to lock it in place. As you can see, we have that V shape in the hair. So that will not pull out. Since I'm not taking this crinkle flash in great big clumps, so I, I mentioned that layer of flash material that is, it's just kinky. And I don't know if you can see this one here. Can we? No, we got one just sticking up here. And if I was taking a big pinch and um, maybe doing something like a saltwater streamer, something really big, that, that those fibers would be okay to, for me to keep in the pinch. But because we're just placing a half dozen, five or six strands on each side, down the lateral line of the jig, it becomes a little bit unruly. I got a couple in here that are slightly kinked. So that, that's what's, that's why I keep placing it and missing with my thread and trying to replace it. Um, trying to just trap them. But because of their crookedness, it holds the pinch away from the uh, collar itself. And I, I want to do my best at locking it in place right down the lateral line. Once the jig gets wet, you know, it. any of the material will lay flat. But again, here's, not sure if you can see the tip of that, but it's, Got this this one right here. It seems though that hairy fiber. It seems to be. It's it seems to be the same material, but a little bit. It doesn't have the uh, glossiness or the reflectiveness. Is the purple or gold? And I'm guessing. I do a lot of guessing. <laughs> um, that it could be the the edges, maybe, of a band of mylar that they're cutting. Um, you know, where you have, I believe, mylars in, in layers um, and heated and compressed. And But as you get to the edges, some of those edges don't really line up, but they're still sealed. Um, I have a, I suspect maybe that's what it is. Maybe if I was a bigger YouTuber, I could, I could go see a Mylar company and do a show and tell, right? So I did a little bit of, um, not research, but I did happen to come across, across some information one of the 
online fly tying sites where I get a lot of materials from had a new section I guess on their website and they kind of talked about the um, reason behind the increase in the um, cost of bucktails lately how it's you know gone up 54 percent since January and their explanation was the um, reduction in China China's reduced the amount of deer hides that they require for their leather industry so that's put a put the kibosh on tails for the US I'm not sure if that's true I don't know it's possible but I would think if if we're selling pelts for leather and textile whatever for fabric around the world China is not the only country that makes leather goods right but that was their explanation that that was kind of their comments on the reasons be, be, uh, behind the increase in uh, bucktails specifically. So for myself, I'm playing with the idea. The wife will not like it um, necessarily, but if I put enough feelers out, if I can get a few hundred deer tails every fall, I could start um, processing them again. Um, kind of like how I used to watch my father growing up. He did it on a much larger scale, not only for his own use for jigging, you know, jig tying and fly tying, but he was selling to other manufacturers. <clears throat> um, in this area, um, in the Catskills, I know he used to tell me stories of the Catskill chicken farmers that he used to. Do business with again one of those stories I should have paid more attention to at the time so that was four wraps towards the bend of the hook two wraps crossing over just to lock it in place And with these pinch, the pinches that I'm taking from the uh, Winter Run Blue New Age Crinkle Flash, trying to get a mix. That pinch, I'm not sure how it shows up, is fairly dark. Mostly, mostly the dark purple. This pinch has that same dark purple but there's one or two gold strands in there trying to make them the same each time trying or well when I take it from the pinch trying not to just pinch all one color um, though it is mixed occasionally you do get clumps of the same color
on this collar there was a little bit of an indent on the um, collar. I just filled that in with a couple extra wraps. Kind of going back and forth a couple times more than usual, but looks just fine. I'm sure that looks nice on on screen. A little bit better, zoomed in. For the longest time on this camera, camera number two, there's a cage around the camera which is of course attached to the little desktop tripod. But I had a little handmade level. I think I took it out of a small torpedo level. And um, what I did is I glued it to a nut about the size of, um, I don't know, I think it was a, I think it was a half. So, you know, from a bicycle, you know, like a the nut that you use to tighten a bicycle wheel on. But I glued it to that just to give it a little bit of heft and weight. And I would just sit it on top of the uh, cage that would wrap this camera. So I could make sure that the picture's square level. Um, because on the screen, the camera screen, it's hard to tell. Because there's no, there's no grid lines or anything. I have it clear. for the output, so it's clear on the computer, right? On the doodly-doo. Um, and even on my monitor here, just to make sure that it's the vices level. But I did uh, find in my box of junk, because <laughs> just like with tying, uh, the kayak and now photography and video, right? Um, we acquire all sorts of junk, extra nuts and bolts and doodads, thingamajigs, right? And I actually have a screw that screws into all the one of the mounting points on this cage that goes around the camera. So I made it more of a permanent level for my camera. It, it, it won't slide off now when I start trying to adjust it. Works good. A lot cheaper than I could buy a level for my tripod for 30 bucks. Seems kind of ridiculous for a little plastic piece, right? So I have a few dozen of the 5 8 1 half and 3 8 football that I painted extra. And that's what I'm you know, that's what we're doing here today. I'm tying, finishing those up, trying to have them done for the weekend. But I'm going to see what the uh, response is. Um, if the bait shops really like this lilac head, I'll keep producing it. Um, I just have to work it into my rotation and uh, make sure that I'm not wasting paint when I mix it. Usually, when I when I mix my epoxy paint, I can paint, of course, depending on the size of the heads, but anywhere between, what do we got? Let me 
see it behind me, the spinning rack. Uh, 3, 6, 9, 12, 14, 16. About 18 dozen. 18 to 24 dozen. I can paint um, with a single batch of epoxy paint. Um, now I could mix more, but I'm not fast enough. You know, there is a, even though it cures chemically and it seems still liquid when I finish, there is a limit. There is a time limit. So you mix the epoxy paint, you wait an hour, you let the chemicals get all chemical-y, right? You let the paint kind of acclimate to itself. So you mix it, you wait an hour. Then I paint, but you only have an hour and a half, maximum two hours. Um, if you're not done painting by then, uh, it's best to just mix a new batch and, and then use the new paint. Um, I have found. So, you know, I could I could mix a whole whole lot of paint to do even more. And you see, here's here's one. Here's a fiber. That's just unruly, right? Pull that right out. Um, so to not waste paint, when I mix the epoxy paint. Um, I use just old tablespoons from the kitchen. Have two spoons, one for the A and one for the B. Um, well, I'll tell you the whole process. So using um, epoxy paint when you're mixing it, um, you want to make sure you're mixing it in a container that's not plastic. Um, and does not have wax. So I use Dixie cups the size that you would um, what are they? 10 ounce? They're the small cups that you would typically see in, in your bathroom, right? Popular in the 70s, early 80s, you know, you get that big plastic uh, Dixie cup holder, you stick that on the wall of your bathroom, right? And then your kids can waste them. But, oh, that's a one half. How did that get in that pile? Oh, two of these are extra. Three, six, nine, ten, twelve. Okay. Um, so you want to make sure that you're using a container that um, no plastic, no wax. Um, it does affect the way epoxy cures. So I use the uh, Dixie cup and the tablespoons, a scoop of the color, and then a scoop of the hardener. And then I just mix it with a popsicle stick that you get at a craft store. Uh, the epoxy paint you let sit for an hour and then I use a uh, one quarter inch sable brush and I have to say uh, it makes a different witch brush and as soon as I lock this on I will grab one just so I can tell you, be sure I have the, the proper name So, and I just noticed this the other day. I'm surprised I've never noticed this before. So 
So this is the one quarter Duro Art 1053 China brush. Now I don't know if that means it's made in China or if it's the China bristles. Okay, but that's what you want. This is this is the only brush that that seems to work the way we want as specifically for painting jig heads, right? Um, but the one thing I just noticed, this is a very old one. Uh, I've been using this one since the early 2000s. It's one of the original, uh, one of the paintbrushes original to, to the uh, inventory or materials that I got when Dad passed, right? This was so this was from his supply. Um, I kind of do the same thing. He probably had a box of these, right? Like when you buy a pen or a pencil instead of buying one or two of each, you just buy a box of pencils and a box of pens, right? And leave them in the closet and forget about them. Um, but the handles are different lengths. They're both the one quarter. This is awful. They're both the one quarter brush size, right? So you can see they're almost a full inch different. This handle is much wider than the, the newer brush on the bottom. And here you can see I was holding them together, right? Um, but the brush on the bottom, where you can read the uh, the printing on the handle, uh, Dad used to get these at a local hobby store that's long gone, GJ's Hobbies. Um, they did model planes or, or uh, RC planes, RC cars. In the 70s, they had D and D stuff, and it was one of the only places I could buy, you know, as a 12 year old. Could find stuff for D and D back in the day, right? We're talking old school, OG, right? Um, <laughs> um, plastic, plastic models. That's what the store was known for. Uh, they they would change over the years. For a time, half the store was um, yarn and fabric, things like that. Um, they try to diversify a little bit when they left their great big building that was here on the main road and went across the river to a smaller shop. Um, they were primarily just RC cars. Um, and then eventually the owner, you know, they get old and retire and so on and so forth. This, that's the only place I could find these brushes. I did a massive internet search and that's where I got the one that I'm showing you today um, with the thinner handle, but it is the same brush. The ends are what's important. They are a sable brush, a natural hair. And for brushing epoxy on jig heads, yes, any sable brush will work, but trust me, um, you know, <laughs> believe me when I tell you, right? Um, it makes a difference. I have other sable brushes. Um, my wife's a painter. I've gone through her stash of brushes and stolen some pretty expensive brushes and they still didn't do what I wanted. Um, I have my own kind of education in history and for commercial art. So I'm not, uh, you know, I, I've, I've had brushes myself But it has something to do with the, the length. If you have a brush that's too long, if the bristles are too long, as you try to paint it across the jig head, it it's it doesn't put the paint onto the, the lead. It just kind of bounces across, so to speak. Um, you know, when you're when you're brushing the paint on. If it's too short and the bristles are too stiff, it puts the paint on, but then it scrapes it right off, um, is the best way I can explain that. So as you're painting it on, instead of getting a nice 
M&M type candy shell. Uh, it starts off with a shell, but then you start seeing streaks because the bristles are, actually, are so short, they're not flexing properly, and it's scraping the paint right off. Um, you know, you, to try to overcompensate for either of those extremes, you try to use a little bit extra paint, but if you use too much paint, um, though epoxy paint isn't super runny, it will form a little bead on the nose when you're hanging them to dry. And you don't want that, you know, that's not what you want. So, so it's, it's these Duro Art, the 1053 brush, the one quarter number 1053. So I did a massive internet search, 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 searched. Um, I would find them. I'd find places where they were pretty expensive. Um, if you buy them from like an art supply type store, um, an office supply type store, they're going to be expensive because they're a natural hair brush. It's worth it, you know, uh, three bucks a brush. Um, I was buying them at the hobby store. I think they were two for a dollar up until the mid 90s and then maybe they were a dollar a piece. But a brush for a dollar a piece, it's, it was pretty good for an inexpensive brush and I just put too many wraps on that. Because I'm talking, so let's back up. Just go back in time just a little bit. And like I said, this is almost live, so we are not editing this. Um, so, getting back to my internet search, searching for these brushes, searching for the brushes. What I found is if you can find the brushes for sale at a hardware store, so... Not a big box store, not Home Depot, not Lowe's, but a, a mom and pop type hardware store. Um, a mom and pop uh, paint, house paint type store. Um, you still find them very inexpensive. So I ended up buying a dozen, I think. I bought a box of them. Just like, just like with pencils, you get a box of them. I think it was a dozen. And they were like a dollar a piece. So I got lucky, but it, it, I had to search quite some time. It took a while. And I would find a couple that were, the price was really good, but you'd, you'd go on to buy them in their inventory. I would say they only had one or two. Um, but if you search long enough, you search hard enough, um, just try to find a, a mom-and-pop hardware store um, for these brushes. That's where you'll get your best price. Um, the good thing about these brushes is they do last a long time. Like I said, this, this older one, the one with the wider handle, which I actually like the bigger handle better, but... I'm not being picky. Um, like I said, is 20 years old. You know, sometime, sometime in the early 2000s. You know, I pulled that out of the the inventory. You know, when when the old brush finally got to the point where I, you know, I couldn't soak it long enough, or you know, I. What ended up happening is instead of using lacquer thinner to clean it, I started using like mech. And um, it just, it's not worth the getting out the extra solution, the extra type, the paint thinner. Mech um, is a type of paint thinner. It's just on steroids compared to a regular lacquer thinner. And though I do have a nice, great big container of it, um, I have it put away. You know, I only use it occasionally um, we've used it um, if you go through some of the videos 
Um, I think we used it in the video where we were making old-fashioned head cement out of um, vintage glue, out of the old glue. Uh, the Duco cement. Um, so I do have the material, but, you know, getting it out and I'm not against, it doesn't bother me using lacquer thinner or even the fact that jig heads are made of lead. That type of thing doesn't bother me. I'm careful. I'm safe. I'm not afraid of the fact that we're using toxic materials. Um... Over the years, people do complain about that or question it. If you're afraid about toxic materials, you know, maybe you're in the wrong hobby. Same with deer tails over the years. And I'll apologize up front if, if anyone uh, is a little bit thin-skinned. But when guys buy tails as an example and they complain they complain about the smell or that they're oily um, yes if you're if you're paying a premium price you know if I if I went to um, one of the fly shops in the Catskills if I went to Deddy's fly shop and I took a tail off the wall I wouldn't expect it to be greasy I wouldn't expect it to be all kinked um, I wouldn't expect, like on this example, the the tip is a little curled. Um, I wouldn't expect it to be curled, the leather curled. I would I'd expect it to be nice and flat and perfect. and Like, I get that. But you're also paying $10 to $15 a tail. But if you're just buying tails from smaller suppliers... Or um, smaller mom and pop type places that um, are buying them from smaller fur processors, and they have a little bit of smell to it. And I'm and I'm not talking about just the. Uh, smell of the vinegar or the smell of the dye. Sometimes they smell, and usually it's because they skipped the step. Um, they didn't go through a final wash and rinse. And um, processors that use borax as opposed to plain salt, um, as example, uh, there it's different. It works the same, but it you know there is a difference. And as you can see, because I'm blabbing. Pinch the hair, but I have no thread. I'm keeping this pinch nice and tight. Oop, boop, boop. A couple wraps around my thing, finger just so I can keep tension on the thread. Lock it on like normal. This pinch is still tight. So, Those things are usually very simple to remedy. You know, you get a tail that's a little bit smelly. You get a tail that has a little bit of fat on the bottom, let's say, which contaminates the Ziploc bag. Or, God forbid, you've taken them out of the Ziploc bag and you throw them into a larger plastic bag with a few other tails, and now you got four or five of them that are a little greasy, right? It's easy enough to take care of that problem. You just, you know, go up to the kitchen, nice warm water, a little dish soap. Um, you could even use shampoo if you wanted, but dish soap, Dawn dish soap works perfect. You wash them out, take them outside, lay them on the ground and spray them with the hose. Make sure all the soap's out. And then you can either hang them and let them drip dry or... I like to place the tails on a piece of plywood so I can kind of move it when the sun kind of 
moves and the house is blocking some of the shade, but I'll just prop a four by eight or, or rather a two by four chunk of plywood with the tails and just let them dry in the sun on a nice sunny day. But it's easy enough to fix. Um, so, you know, trying to finish my rant. But the guys that get all bent out of shape out of that, you know, keep in mind we are using natural materials. You know, this thing was on a deer's ass at one point. Um, so because of that, you know, yes, if, if, you're, if you're paying high prices for something, I wouldn't expect that, but it's easy enough to remedy. I don't get too bent out of shape. I've had tails that are gross. I've had tails that... I bought tails from some guys who swear that they were perfect, and it's... No. Um, since I'm familiar with the process, since I used to do the process, you know, I can tell if... A lot of times it's just that they skip that final step. The tails look done look finished but they haven't got a final wash and rinse and maybe maybe I should show that um, when I get the t when I take the tails out the next time I have a nice hot sunny day that I'm not tying I will get the tails out of the garage and I will video the process just of getting the salt off them and washing them drying them um, I like to comb them before I put them away so I'll I'll wash and dry them and comb them out um, and I usually comb a tail when I open the package and I'll show you that in just a second I got a I got a comb here I found it in a parking lot 19. It was before I could drive. It was 83, 84. Hold on. Let me get this in place. These fibers are going to drive me crazy. How long have we been tying? Just about an hour. Almost an hour. As you can see... Very long. And again, there's a small indent here. I'm not sure if that shows up. Um, I did have that V shape in my hair um, as I locked the hair on. But when I pulled out some slack, um, I crushed it. Ba um, basically, some, some of the hairs on this tail feel spongy. They're not necessarily hollow, um, completely hollow, but they do feel they compress a little bit. And I think that's what happened here is I just compressed that. Fill that in just slightly uh, with a few extra wraps. But here is a comb. I have had, like I said, 83, 84. It was before I, before I got my driver's license. Uh, in 85 I still had a I had a part-time job after school and I found this in the parking lot in the hospital that I I worked at uh, a hospital here locally but when I get a tail when I open the package I brush it out um, always brush the tails uh, like the ones I have in the garage I know that those were shot locally processed locally they were all split and salted by me um, so even though I wash them in soap and water, I rinse them. I usually, um, after rinsing them, sometimes I wash them a second time and rinse them again. Sometimes you get blood and poo and dirt and mud and burrs, all sorts of things. Ticks, dead ticks, um, will be kind of mixed in with the hair. 
um, that doesn't always wash out. It sometimes it's stuck in there. Burr, burrs in particular. But just to have an old old comb on your table um, to use. It's also a good way to tell if your tail needs to get its hair washed. You go to comb it and it's slick. Phone's ringing. Like I said, we're live. And let me check this other monitor just briefly. What do you think about this color? That lilac color? Um, I am going to do, I'm going to do two dozen each with this lilac head um, with purple top and bottom and then a black and purple. I'll probably use the same uh, crystal flash, that new age crinkle flash, the winter run blue for both. But it's a pretty jig. I like that. I do like this color. There's another couple colors. There's a funky orange dad painted for somebody and a hideous, ugly it's kind of this shade of chartreuse, but it's not fluorescent. It is gross. It looks, it looks like pea, uh, like pea soup. Um, but I found some of those heads. I don't know why they painted them. Um, I, it's 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 such an ugly color. Like I can't even envision it as a as a jig head color. But um, let's do one more, and then I think that will do it for us. Again, this was um, an almost live. I'm going to keep all the mistakes in. I'm going to, um, you know, all the warts, warts and all, right? Again, we're using up this purple tail. I have, I have three of them. Um, it's not a terrible color, but it seems to be more of a cool purple as opposed to a warm purple. But I don't want to waste these tails. I don't want them to just sit unused forever. Trying to figure out on the website how I can add a custom area um, where, let's say, you go on the 5 8 Barumba. I would like a selection on there that says custom, and then you can um, just type in what you want. Uh, ideally, that would be um, fine. Probably the easiest, but I. I can't figure out, and I don't think the program that I use for the website actually has that ability. So um, I am fudging around a little bit, just trying to play with different ideas or different, you know, I'm just trying different things and then seeing if it works, basically. Um, But somehow, you know, to get a, um, a message, um, the ability to have a message attached to the order um, in more than one message, um, that's the other thing. It might work with one, you know, so I could have one, you know, click custom and then say black and purple with red flash. Um, but... If you also wanted black and purple with silver flash, I don't, I could, I can't figure out how to, you know, have the ability for people to order just custom things or more than one custom thing. So, but check out the website, jworthhandtied.com. I do put as much as I can on there, um, at least every week or so. 
Um, I try to go in and update at least one new thing um, or add to the uh, inventory that is shown available. I recently put some hooks for sale. Um, I got a really good deal on some dry fly hooks. Well, it is a box of hooks, a, a big selection, um, but mostly dry fly hooks. But I also had some streamer hooks as well as some wet fly hooks. Um, I squirreled away the boxes uh, that I wanted to keep for myself, but then the extras I put on the website to pass uh, the savings along. I'm happy to do that. I also have some really nice Cortland fly line, whole bunch of boxes. It was inventory from an old uh, a store that had closed down, the, the owner retired. And I put the uh, fly line on the eBay. I've sold about half, half of it so far. But I might I might switch and put that just put it on my website. It's it's easier in some regard. This collar, how did that look? I'm kind of rushing it. It looks okay on the monitor. This is pushing the limits of length. I think we've talked about this in other videos. Um, I try to make the collar as short as possible and actually this doesn't look too bad but it's to my eye looking at it right now that's pushing the limit of what I would prefer to see but it's not bad it's a nice jig put some comments down below how you like this lilac colored head and the uh, cool purple but I think that will do it for us today we tied a little bit over just about an hour maybe a little bit over um, let me know how you like the uh, format of the almost live like I said um, keeping in all the warts all the mistakes um, and then I just babble while I while I tie. Um, it's a format that I'll I'll do occasionally. I think people kind of enjoy that, and I enjoy just turning the the cameras on while I'm tying um, without having to come up with a, a theme um, for the uh, video. But I think that's doing it for us today. Um, as always, like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any new content. Um, like we mentioned earlier, check the website, jworthhandtied.com. Um, keep tying, and until next time, guys, tight lines.